society have got me out of retirement here tonight <laughs> because many years ago um, I used to go around and give talks on the vintage cars and particularly on bars. When I retired, I said, well, enough's enough, and that was it. But um, I think Mike Mumford was responsible for <laughs> this lapse of mine. Um, <laughs> and, and so here I am. Uh, but what I realized was that um, before I start showing the slides, I'll just say one or two words. What I have realized in the last few years is how things have changed so much in the world of vintage cars. When I started off in the well, late 40s, really, was my first car, and suddenly in the 50s, um, people literally laughed at the old car and uh, looked upon them as well. What the hell is he playing about with that for? It was, it was looked upon as a bit of a, a, a comic thing. Well, I enjoyed engineering, and I used to tell the story about the American who visited Anglesey, a Texan farmer. And he got talking to an Anglesey farmer. And in America, he wanted to know how big was this farm of yours. And this is what he said to the farmer, how big is the farm? And the old farmer pointed to a few landmarks and he said, under the acres, he said, I make a living. Gee, he said, but I come from in Texas, he said. I get into my car in the morning, and it takes me all day to drive around my farm. Well, do, said the old farmer. I used to have a car like that once. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's, a, that's a type of car which I might be talking about tonight. Now, um, I'd like it to be fairly informal. If you want to break in on my chatter when I show the slides on, do so. Um, that can be fine. But in any case, at the end, if you have any questions, I'll be only pleased to, pleased to answer them. Now, um, I've got a projector there. It doesn't belong to me. Um, it belongs to somebody else, so I hope it will work. And um, I'll stand to the side and we'll make a start. Now, which way is the post going to be for that? Now, that's about it. Okay, all systems close, they say. Can I find the first one? Do you want the switch on now? It is on. You find and press the first one, I think it will drop in. Oh, it's on standby. Oh, that's, that's not our projector. Oh, okay, try the first shot. Try the first slide. Oh, it works. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> now, we uh, use that slide to focus things and that sort of thing earlier on. Um, but it also indicates, as Dave Mills pointed out to me, the f slide is very dusty. Well, of course it's dusty. It's a year since it was last shown. And, uh, and I show the slide in order to um, focus the machine, but also to indicate to you um, where I live in Capital there. Um, the house is in the trees just to the left of centre there. And all the goings on have taken place there. And I think part of the where you live helps the um, uh, helps the work in some sense, helps your attitude towards the work. Now, if I can find the button, do it off. Now, I started off in the 50s <laughs> with, with that Model T Ford. I normally don't talk money, but because things have changed so much in the vintage car world, and prices have gone through, they were quite stupid. I bought that car in Metro for £5. <laughs> and um, it was a 1920 Model T Ford, one of the millions that he made at the time. And I spent the best part of a year messing about with that to produce the, that car at the end. Um, and this was in the 50s, and it was relatively easy then to get bits and pieces for it. Well, now then, um, I'll go through these very quickly. While I was working on the first T Ford, somebody came along and said, I know where there is one down in Dinos Mowry. And that was a little trip to Dinos Mowry where I bought the, the second model T Ford. And they were both eventually put together. And um, in fact, the car at the back there, the red car, OH918, I was offered it back last year for seven and a half thousand. Uh, the same car. Well, now, um, uh, my dream had always been to have a vintage Bentley. And the opportunity came in 1960 when um, I found this Bentley dismantled in Clandidno. And um, it was dismantled more or less in the state that you see it there. Uh, a very interesting car, 
one a very desirable car, a six and a half litre Speed Six Bentley, one of 170 that were made. Um, one of them, not this car, of course, but one of them won the Le Mans 24 hour days on successive years in 1929 and 1930. Very sturdy and very well built and reliable car. Now that was assembled. There's the engine of the Bentley. Um, nothing really new today, four valves, per cylinder, overhead camshaft, um, uh, dual ignition, uh, dampers on the camshaft, down the camshaft, and all this way back in 1930. And the finished car now, um, with the two-seater body on, on one of our local roads. Now then, we follow that with another car which I found then in Colwyn Bay, uh, belonged to a, a person who I got quite friendly with, Peter Baker, uh, he lives on the Mena Estates there now. This was a 1925 French Delage, which uh, has been a favourite in the family, and that's a photograph taken of it in the uh, garage, as I found it, in Common Bay. And that was brought to Capo Kirik, and there is the Delage completed now. Uh, we still have that car. Uh, and I think more of a favourite than the Bentley, really, because it's more usable. So now we have two cars. The next car I found was um, uh, in um, Rio near Abersoch, top of Rio. David Lloyd, the port of Norway, got wind of this and took me there. And inside that little shack there, there was a 1908 Argyle, a Scottish car. Mm -hmm. And this was in a terrible state, um, but it was worth having to go at. And it was literally dug out of there because so many of the parts had been buried in the pits. And there's the Argyle, um, as it arrived in Capri Kirik, just a basic chassis and the body, um, very little body, just the front end, and another view from the front. Mm. Now, it took uh, quite a while to um, rebuild this and restore this because most of the parts had to be replaced. But I eventually um, did restore this, and, and there's the Argyle, and it is now actually in the Kevin Hall Museum in Glasgow. Um, I went to see it one day and I told the, the chap on the floor that used to be my old car. So he got the boss man, the curator or whatever they call them, of the museum down to talk to me. And I, I walked around it and I explained to him what I'd done. And of course there wasn't, there wasn't a single part of the body of that car that was original. And he was passing it off as being a very original car. <laughs> <laughs> and it wasn't long before we were able to, we put two rear sleepers like that and we got the JCB to come along and we put it open, we just rolled the car gently onto the sleepers, pulled it out of the, the water. Um, again, a bit of luck, a gentleman from Saunderswood next door came along to me and said, um, I've got a crane hire business in Saunderswood, he said, would you like me to come along and lift it out? And that was another great bonus, of course, uh, to be had, perhaps lifted out I put on the trailer, <coughs> which um, plates in front of me, the trailer to go down. And uh, there is Babs now out of the hall ready for transport back to Cabo Um uh, Shows some of the damage that was caused. Um, on the offside there, the rear, the back axle was bent forward and the front axle was bent backwards. <coughs> which meant it had got end over end on that sand um, at that high speed. And there was no thought to begin with that the car would ever run again. It was just a question of making something which was, as I said, to put in a museum to commemorate Paris Thomas. But when I got to that stage, I thought, wouldn't it be rather splendid if everything, every component that went back on that chassis fulfilled its original function, so that at the end we'd have a running car. And from that point on, we took that uh, extra care uh, in whatever we tackle. Now, there's the engine uh, with a little Austin 7 engine on top, uh, just to give a comparison of size. Um, it was an American Liberty Aero engine, as I mentioned, First World War, capacity of 27 litres. Uh, B12, um, four carburetors uh, that Paddy Thomas had fitted on himself, and then at the propeller end, which is on the right there, um, the propeller end was the design and fitted uh, a clutch of his own design there. Yes, they had built a new pattern using that, that casing. 
they've taken it all up and made patterns and so on, and they cast a new gearbox casing. And this was a, a fantastic contribution. And that's the new gearbox casing, ready for machining for uh, the, the bearing surfaces and so on. And which they did, and they brought, handed it back to me in Capricari, and all I had to do now was to set the, fit the whole thing together, fit the selector rods and so on. I managed to get a Liberty switch from America, an uh, ignition switch, and the distributors were a problem, they were made by Delco. But I found a chap in New York who said he had the pair, $75. I sent him $75, I have not seen him or the distributors since. <laughs> <laughs> and so I got it to this stage, I thought, well, um, we better see what will happen. And uh, one quiet Friday afternoon, I let Gavin know, I said, let's have a go and see what, whether we can start it up. And we <coughs> put it down the drive and got it onto the A5. And um, I was doing this all quietly, but people appeared from all over the place. <laughs> and and uh, the last thing I wanted was any uh, collection of people to do attention to ourselves. But we took it onto the A5, and there it has been towed to all that way. And lo and behold, it fired. And um, it was, of course, terribly exciting uh, to have this engine running. Uh, one didn't expect, one didn't know what to expect in a way. There is Babs, um, uh, pretty well finished there, um, outside the bank in Bangor. Yeah. And I thought it very appropriate, but in some ways uh, it, it must belong a bit, took belong a bit to the bank. <laughs> because it set the verses, stretched, stretched the verses quite a bit over the years. And so um, the complete car is there.